coming this morning. And for those of you uh, who were there last night and are back, we really appreciate it. Uh, it has been a wonderful launching event. We started yesterday, and yes, we have kept Dr. Greenwald very busy. Uh, to give you a little uh, brief uh, overview of what, hap what has happened thus far, is this journey started two years ago with a vision that was really because of a tragic event that I experienced here at our facility with the tragic death of one of uh, my close friends, a colleague of ours. And uh, with that vision, wanted to know how to operationalize it and really sought to the Medical Society for help and have been really appreciative of their support, the support of the board members there, and of course, Ray Bond, who really is the energy behind the project that we are going to tell you about, the Life Bridge project. Uh, this is for you, and uh, I appreciate all of you supporting, especially as we were collecting the data, completing the survey. Um, so with that, we put together a well-being task force, and uh, they've put in a lot of energy to get where we are today. As we were sort of thinking about what we needed to do for the launching event, one name came up, and that was Dr. Greenwald, uh, who, as you know from his bio, which has been circulated quite a bit, he is a practicing clinician at the Carillion uh, Clinic, uh, completed his uh, medical school and residency training at UVA. But he is really a mover and shaker in this arena, not just in, within the system where he works, but I think the impact of what he is doing is also felt nationally. He has a powerful story of what he has done to change the system within his organization, but also a powerful personal story. So he shared that with us uh, yesterday. We started off with a session called the Principles of Practice, um, Healthcare Principles and Practice, for which is a didactic conference for residents and uh, students and fellows, and some faculty were there yesterday. After that, we got together with the stakeholders from the three major health systems in our area, Park Ridge Memorial, Erlanger, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, and had a roundtable discussion and actually shared the data, accumulative data without any identifiers, of the survey that uh, the Medical Society had administered on behalf of the Wellbeing Task Force in early, uh, earlier this year. We had some brainstorming sessions, and then, of course, we had a very elegant uh, evening yesterday uh, at the Embassy Suites where we really had a time to unpack what it means to be well, not just for ourselves, but with, for our relationship with others, and especially our family and loved ones. And today we are having uh, this grand rounds, and then we will be having a debriefing session again with him and really looking at the next steps of what do we do together as a community to continue this momentum and to really think about what can we do individually for ourselves, our organization, for this community, and the patients that we serve. So with that, Mark, welcome again. Thank you, Mukta. It's wonderful to be here. Good morning, everyone. Turn that down. So I, I, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. And, and despite the pace of, of our time together, it's been a lot of fun. And I hope it's been very helpful. I see a lot of familiar faces from different events yesterday. Uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, for those of you who were here at noon yesterday, there's going to be a lot of similarities between what I talk about today and what I talked about yesterday, a difference being that we're going to start to get a little bit more specific near the end of my talk about some things that we're doing at Carillion Clinic that I'm hoping will feed into our discussion that's going to occur right after this and give the committee some ideas about some things that, 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 may, that the, the group may want to consider as you continue to roll out this really wonderful initiative. So. We're going to start by diving into the deep end of the pool right away by asking a, a really important question. What would it take for you to say, I love my work? Or perhaps what would it take for the medical community to be able to say, we love our work? Very important. And, and unfortunately, statistically, that's not the case for most individuals. That's not the case for most medical groups right now. As we know, there's a lot of struggling going on uh, within the health community. 
We're going to be talking a little bit about burnout today, but I want to start by saying that this conversation is bigger than burnout. Burnout was, in many ways, the catalyst to get us to this point in the conversation. But what we're really talking about is physician distress, and I use physician broadly for those here who are, who are not physicians but do clinical work. Um, but we're also talking about not just distress, but we're also talking about what is on the other side of distress, this thing called well-being. It's not enough to just not be burned out. There's got to be more to it than that. And so what, what could that look like for, again, us as individuals and as a medical community? As, as, as Mukta shared, uh, I do have a story, a reason why I'm so passionate about this work. I'm not going to be sharing that this morning. I went into some detail about that last night. Um, but needless to say, it involved a tragic patient outcome that impacted me deeply and impacted everyone on the healthcare team that was part of that outcome. And it's not unique. It's not unique at all in that we've all had outcomes that I believe have, and, and I'll use this word, it may be strong for some of you, have haunted us, have followed us around, and, and in some cases to this day, we've likely not healed from those. And those inform not only our work, but they inform our personal lives as well, sometimes not in a very healthy way. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I will disclose that I'm at a place right now where I can truly say, I love my work. It's not always been the case. And so I, I, I do want to come here and say I'm not Pollyanna about what's going on in healthcare right now. I'm, I'm in the middle of it. I deal with it every day, not only in my clinical work, but also in my leadership work as well. So here's a few things that I'm hoping we accomplish today. Some of you have already experienced the burnout to thriving continuum, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, talk a little bit about national data and allow that to inform uh, what's going on here. Local data, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And as, as uh, Mukta pointed out, uh, there, we have some local data that's been coming out and is going to be discussed more. And then talking about a framework, and I think that's, for many of you, going to be the most important thing when you start to think about how could we here begin to frame this conversation differently. Those of you who've been to any of my talks know that I, I want to invite you into this place. I want you to be able to be fully present here. So I want you to check in at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the only group in our organization that has 7 o'clock grand rounds is our orthopedics group. Um, everybody else does 7.30. So, uh, so you all are bright and early and coming here and already seeing a group who was here probably at 6 o'clock to do fire training. Um, that's admirable. So check in with you around energy openness and focus. Uh, first thing is energy, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Some of you, I know, were out late last night because I saw you. Uh, and so if you would just take a moment to welcome the other people in the group, say good morning. I can't believe we're crazy enough to be here, but here we are, way to go. Go ahead and fist pump everybody and, and just say that. Energy is important, and uh, sometimes it's hard to come by without some caffeine at 7 in the morning. Openness. So I'm hoping that for some of you, we stretch you a little bit this morning. I'm, I'm hoping that, that I, I'm able to challenge you in some ways about your own thinking around this idea of, of clinician distress. So I'm going to just put a, a, I'm going to put a paragraph up here on the board. And what I'd ask you to do is just read it out loud. Simple exercise. So here's the amazing thing about that. That's truly gibberish. Yeah. That paragraph makes no sense at all. And yet, if I had each of you read that individually, you would have come to the same conclusion about that paragraph. So why is that important? It's important because from an openness perspective, we have to acknowledge that we fill things in all the time. Okay, that's part of the way our, our, our thinking works. And so thinking about this area around well-being and burnout, what I find is that we bring into this conversation our own prejudices, our own experiences. That includes our own leadership at Curlian Clinic, many of whom I believe clinically have never experienced a lot of distress in their own world. And so they can't fathom how it could be possible that others do. So being aware of both our blind spots and then those areas that we augment becomes very important in this conversation. Finally, focus. I know this is not a competitive group at all, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a series of words. And what I would ask you to do is read these words out loud, and when you're finished reading them, just raise your hand. Very simple. Okay, and I'm going to time you, just because I know you're not competitive. All right, here we go. 
Let's read them out loud. All right. Pretty much everybody under 10 seconds. All right. So that woke up the left side of your brain. Now, metaphorically, we want to wake up the right side of your brain. So we're going to do the same exercise again, but this time, instead of reading the words, I want you to say the name of the color that the word is. And when you're completed, do it out loud. And when you're completed, please raise your hand again. The clock begins. Oh, I'm waiting. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. So, so all we ask you to do there was one extra step, and your mind had to do all kinds of mental gymnastics to switch around. So focus will be very important this morning. So why are you here? You're about to invest an hour of your life energy and our time together this morning. So ask yourself, why am I here? Particularly those of you who came yesterday and have come back again. What am I hoping to get out of this, this morning? What do I hope is going to be different? And for some of you who were here yesterday, I want to challenge you particularly to say, yesterday was your chance to begin to think about this perhaps differently. Today, I want to, I want to challenge you to, to ask yourself, how can I take some of this information, not just back for myself, but thinking about my team and being able to apply this in new and different ways? And in doing that, I want you to think about three things. Anything that jumps out at you is what I would call a highlight. Any insights that come to you? Because I have no idea where each of you are coming from on this topic. And so seeing what jumps out to you and being curious about that. Isn't that interesting that that particular thing really struck me today? What does that mean for me? And finally, actions. One of the things that we're going to be asking each other in this, in this whole, in this whole uh, program that's being rolled out is, how can we all begin to do this and look at this differently? So how are you? On this continuum from burnout to surviving to fine, talked a lot last night about fine, um, to well to thriving, where would you place yourself on this continuum over the last few weeks of your life, knowing that life vacillates and we go through phases? But if you have to average it out, where would you say you are right now? For many of us, this is where we are. We get up and it's Groundhog Day. Here we go again. We're going to do that same thing, and we're going to grind it out, and tomorrow we're going to grind it out, and every now and then we get a vacation that comes in there, or every now and then something either has us come out of that, or it takes us deeper because of some unfortunate thing that happens. How can we break out of that? Talk a little bit about survival. Survival is a place that many of us know near and dear because we have been socialized in healthcare often to believe that not only is survival as good as it gets, but survival is a good thing because those who don't survive fall by the wayside. And depending on when you trained and where you trained, you watched colleagues along the way fall by the wayside. And unfortunately, often we looked at them and said they were the weak ones. And so how do we begin to break out of the socialization that we have in healthcare, thinking that those who are struggling because of the incredibly challenging, wonderful but challenging work we do, how can we begin to think about that differently? This is a picture of my own team, my team in, in, in one of our family medicine centers. Um, we actually took this off of a parking garage. Um, what I love about this picture is not just that I think it turned out really well, but also this represents, I believe, what really goes on with our team. We've done some very specific work to try to bring this group together around a common identity. And it translates into the kind of care that we provide for the patients and the kind of caring that we provide for each other in the process of doing that. This is a definition of thriving. This is from Jim Lair. Jim Lair is the, is the, is the executive director of the Human Performance Institute for Johnson & Johnson. He spent his life thinking a lot about what human potential could look like. And this is how he defines this place called thriving. Physically energized, emotionally grounded, mentally focused, relationally connected, and spiritually aligned. And did a survey last night. I'm not going to do it today. But I would, I would suspect that each one of you can think of a time in your own life, maybe not all at the same time, where you've experienced each one of those. My hope is you've done that a lot. And what I would tell you is that often we look at something like thriving, we look at these states and we think, well, that's not possible within healthcare. 
that, that part of what we've chosen, part of our badge of honor in the process of doing this profession is that we've had to give up the opportunity to thrive in our work and in our life. And, and what I want to challenge you is to say, that doesn't have to be so. And what would that look like for you? And I, and I want to say something else about thriving. I, I've had some, some, some of my colleagues come to me and say, you know, thriving sounds like hyperkinetic. Thriving sounds like super positive. Everything's great. And I just want to tell you that that's not the case. Each one of you is going to have a set point for what thriving looks like. And each one of you has a personality as to how thriving will express itself. But thinking about that for you, what could that state look like for you? And do you believe that's actually something that you could attain? So we talk a little bit about the, the sorry, I'm going. The elephant in the room, or what I call the elephant in the exam room, becomes an important part of this process of really beginning to think about clinician distress and clinician well-being in different ways. Six months ago, I, I, I did a grand rounds tour in our own health system as we rolled out some new initiatives and a new committee at, at our own organization. After I did the medicine grand rounds, I got an a email from one of my colleagues. And her email said, I was at the grand rounds, but I was on the phone. So you didn't know I was there. And the reason that I was on the phone is because I knew what you were going to be talking about at Grand Rounds. And I was afraid if I was there in person, I would have started to cry. This caught my attention. This is not somebody who I would have thought would have been in that situation. And then she said in her email, I'd like to meet with you. It's great. So we met a week later. And the story she shared with me, and this is a woman who you would look at and say, she's the thriver. She's the happy one. She's the one where everything's going well all the time. She's the awesome mother. She's the incredible spouse. And she sat there and she said, three months ago, I was an hour away from committing suicide. So this is what happened. She said, I had a plan. And here was my plan. I was going to drive off the side of the road into a deep gully. And I was going to take my life. And I was going to have my phone right beside me to make it look like I was trying to text while I was driving. And that's why it happened. She said, the only thing that stopped me was that I got a call from one of my colleagues during that time. And out of the blue, they just said, hey, I was thinking about you today. And I'm just wondering how you're doing. Now, what do you think she told them? Fine. I'm fine. She said, I'm fine. But that alone snapped her out of this. And she said, the only reason at that point I decided not to do it was not for me, because I was done. But I realized the legacy I would leave behind for my two children and my husband. I bring that to you because this is real stuff. This is happening, and those stories are horrific, and those stories are perhaps extreme, but they're real. Statistically, there's someone sitting in this room right now who's contemplated at some point because of the stress of their professional life taking their own life. So how can we begin to reframe this conversation so people never get to that point where they truly believe the only option for them is to take their own life rather than reaching out for help? Because most of these folks in healthcare who choose to do that, it's not that they've reached out for help and help has failed them, it's that they've never reached out at all because they don't believe that anybody could possibly help them. And where does that come from? That comes from our socialization. So here's the journey, the journey that, I, that we've been taking at Curly and Clinic. It's a journey that, that I think is a nice model and, and you will find yourself somewhere along this continuum this morning. First thing is we need to name this as a problem. Call it what you will. Again, I like to call it physician distress. But we've got a problem. Now, it's not a new problem. But the problem does seem to be getting more severe. And the problem certainly is becoming more noticed. And my plea for you this morning is that as you as a healthcare community start talking about this, and people start sharing their stories, and people start reaching out for help, that you're not tempted to do what for many of us happened along our journey when we even hinted that we might not be doing well, which is that we were shamed. That people said you're weak, 
You don't have what it takes. Maybe you should go do something else. So how can we make sure, as we begin to name this, that we don't fall into that? Second thing is that we need to claim this. It's our problem. And in the process of doing that, not being tempted to give up our power by saying, it's all these other things out there. And, and I want to address that. One, one, of, one of the physicians who attended yesterday came down to me afterwards and, and shared that they were troubled by that idea of not blaming. And so I want to clarify that because I think it's really important. This is not about being doormats, okay? And certainly I believe there are forces going on outside of our healthcare communities that are impacting us hugely, and we need to do something about that. What I also believe is that me as an individual cannot change some of the things that are happening at the level of the federal government. My, my health care societies, as a group, we can do that. And they are, we are doing that. Not just my own specialty society, American Medical Association, your own specialty societies, they're doing those things. But at the level of the individual and the organization, we have to be very careful about saying, if only, in my case, if only Epic would go away, since that's our health care record, burnout would go away. Now, there's a lot of things about Epic that I think could be a whole lot better. But what I do know as well is it's not going away in our organization. We've spent over $100 million on that technology. And so what we can do about that is we can optimize that. And what we learned when we started looking at our own group is that there were many of our group who were using that tool like they learned it on the first day. They had never improved their skills around it. That's on us because we didn't educate them well. So how can we make sure that we do this differently? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Third thing is framing this. It's a complex problem. This is not a simple problem. And in doing that, not being tempted, as I'm watching some do nationally right now, to say, ah, it's a problem. It's our problem. I know what we need to do about this. I was listening to a healthcare summit that our CEO attended. She sent me the, the recording of it, uh, and, and it, it happened in a few weeks ago. And it was fascinating to me listening to different CEOs from around the country who had attended this, all espousing the answer to this problem. And it was the answer. And what was so fascinating about it to me is the answer that they came to was different as you watched these different CEOs in action. This is a complex problem, and so we have to be careful about proclaiming easy solutions to a complex problem. And finally, taming it. We can and we need to do something about this. And in doing that, making sure we're not tempted to disclaim it is a problem, it's our problem, it's a complex problem, but there's no data that shows anything works. I'm going to talk about that this morning. Our secret weapon is the fourth aim. Hopefully some of you at least are familiar with the triple aim in our own organization, and it is what drives us better health, better care, at a lower cost. Chris Sinsky and Tom Bodenheimer published a really thoughtful paper in 2014, and they coined the term the quadruple aim. They said, we will never achieve this aspirational goal of the triple aim if we don't do one very important thing, and that is take, to take care of those who are asking to put that in action. If we don't do that, it'll never happen. And so they, we, we coin that as the fourth aim. Often you have to stop and say, the fourth aim almost sounds like an afterthought. Maybe it should be the first aim to make sure we can do our primary aim, which is to take care of our patients. So it's a problem. Is burnout real? If I had all of you raise your hands right now to, in an answer to this question, do you know someone who you're working with right now who by whatever definition you would use is burned out? Well, let's do it. Do you know someone right now who by any, whatever definition is burned out? Yeah. When I do talks around the country, it's, it's usually a super majority who, who do that. And here's the interesting thing about that. that. You didn't have to stop and think about that. And likely it's like person. How about persons? All right. Those people are practicing in this hospital right now. Those people are taking someone to the OR to open up part of their body to try to help save their life right now. How do we make sure that that is not happening? Because that could be our own family members. That could be us. Here's my definition of burnout. Burnout's a condition. It's not a diagnosis. It's a chronic condition. We can have a tough weekend on call. 
We can feel spent, but that doesn't mean we're burned out, at least by this definition. It's an emotional condition. We can be physically exhausted. We can be mentally exhausted. But burnout is really talking about, I've got nothing left emotionally in my tank. And it's caused by distress. It's not caused by stress. There's a lot of stress that's good. We call it eustress. It helps strengthen us. It helps build, helps build us. It helps us grow. This is about distress. And we have a lot of that in healthcare. And we're talking particularly when we talk about professional burnout in the context of work and making one important assumption, and that is that, that any distress that comes to us, if we have the opportunity and the skills to recover, we can keep on going. Hopefully we can even grow from that. But if we don't, and if we don't have some downtime that is specifically designed to help us with that, over time we will corrode emotionally on the inside, and that will begin to be expressed as this thing we call burnout. Christina Maslach of Maslach Burnout Inventory fame, Maslach Burnout Inventory is one of the main instruments that's used to measure burnout in a lot of the studies that are being done nationally, said there are three components to burnout. One is emotional exhaustion. We got nothing left in the tank. We are spent emotionally. Would love to give, got nothing to give. The second is what she called cynicism or depersonalization, the idea that those fellow human beings who are coming to us seeking our help in a time of suffering and crisis, we begin to look at those, those people as objects rather than fellow human beings. And then finally, inefficacy or meaninglessness, the idea that we start to believe that the good and important work that we do doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. And she said, when we get to that state in any one of these areas, to enough extreme, we begin to experience this thing called burnout. And she said, in that place, we are experiencing an erosion of the soul, which I don't know about you, but the first time I saw that term, having experienced burnout in my own life and knowing what that means and realizing the work that we do demands to a certain degree that we bring some of that soul, however you would define that, into our work. And if we start to lose that, we lose the very essence of why we do what we do in the first place, the calling of healthcare. 2012, Tate Shanafelt and his group at Mayo Clinic published a study looking at burnout by the Maslach burnout inventory around the country, and they found that the mean high risk for burnout was 46%. And I want to emphasize that because a lot of the national dialogue, even around these studies, quotes people as saying 46% of physicians were burned out. It's not the case. The Baslack burnout inventory does not measure that. It measures risk for burnout. Now, likely, most of those people actually are experiencing burnout. We don't know that. But regardless, 46%, that's pretty impressive. 2012, when the study was published, not a whole lot happened. Not a whole lot changed. This had been airline pilots. I believe congressional hearings would have happened. But for doctors, I believe most folks who knew about the study looked at it, thought about their own life, thought about their own team, and said, 46%. Yeah, that sounds about right. And then we went on our business. 2015, Shannon Felt and his group repeated the study again. And they found during that period of time, the mean risk for bur high burnout went from 46 to 54%. Every specialty increased during that time. Even the road specialties, as we like to call them. And if you think about it, the lowest specialty, in this case preventive medicine, 40% high risk for burnout. So we're not protected from this by the specialty that we choose. There's something more going on here. And here's the other thing to think about that data. This is just another way to present it, which is to say if 54% of physicians are at high risk for burnout, that doesn't mean the other 46% are doing wonderfully, which is often what we assume. Statistically, it probably looks more like this, that most of those others are struggling. Most of those others are living in this place that I call surviving or survival mode. The good news is the 2015 study caught the attention of a lot of folks nationally and probably was one of the catalysts for the fact that we're sitting here right now. This is from the, the, the National Academy of Medicine who brought together leaders from organizations all over the country to begin to say, let's try to figure out how to do this together 
and begin to address this because this is bigger than any one of us. And they've been doing some wonderful work around that. So claim it. It's our problem. Healthcare, like every other profession, has a culture. And in the culture of healthcare, physicians are socialized to, to many, different, many different activities, many different attitudes. But one of them is that we don't talk about this historically. The fact that we're here right now is amazing. There are many places around the country that we wouldn't even be having these conversations right now, even despite the data. So how can we make sure that we're not tempted to not talk about this? Those in leadership and administration in healthcare, often their temptation is to say, you know what? I don't want to hear it right now. We've got other things going on. We've got to balance this budget. We've got to stay in the black somehow. Just get back to work. Do your job. Be grateful. And patients and payers, they're often blind to this. I mean, think about it. What if patients came in this morning, I'm using the OR as an example, and as they all sat there about to, to go under, they looked at their anesthesiologist and their surgeon and they said, how are you doing today? You burned out? Because if you're burned out, I don't think I want you operating on me this morning. That would be catastrophic, particularly if we were honest and say, you know what? Now that you ask, I'm not doing that well today. Maybe I shouldn't be operating on you. The whole system would collapse. So how do we begin to think about this differently? At our own organization, after the 2015 data came out, I sat down with our clinical chairs and our chief medical officer, and I said, here's the data. Now, I had presented the 2012 data to them, and I got about the same response that happened nationally, which is, yeah, sounds bad. So what we did, I presented the 2015 data, got about the same response, and we said, all right, fine. Let's go ahead and do our own study, because we were tempted to believe we had organizational exceptionalism, as I like to call it. We are Carilion Clinic. We're Erlanger. We're better than that. And so what we did is we did our survey. And what did we find? We found that we're the national average. Not just for our physicians. We, did, we surveyed our advanced care practitioners. There's not a lot of national data on advanced care practitioners, but they weren't doing very well. Our residents, that's the national average for residents, 60%. Scary. Our residents are in the front lines of care in our academic medical centers, fried. And our medical students, we have a new medical school in Roanoke. We coddle those students. They were, they were special, 48% of them, high risk for burnout. So the good news about that at Curling Clinic is that rallied the forces. And we already had the infrastructure in place because we'd been working behind the scenes to build that infrastructure. And this opened our eyes and catalyzed our work. If you think about it, you think about the work that we do, of course we're at risk. Why should we be surprised at this data, thinking about the emotional toll, the emotional investment we make in our work, and therefore the emotional toll, the emotional risk that we have in doing it? And here's the other challenge for us, is that even when we do recognize it, even when somebody else says, I don't think you're doing very well, we fight that. We say, you know what, that's possible, but maybe there's another explanation for this. Because we associate being burned out as being a sign of weakness. And there's no way we're weak. We couldn't have gotten here right now if that was the case. And where has this conspiracy of silence gotten us? All of these places. And I'm confident that in this case, you are not any more exceptional than Curlian Clinic in the context of having all these things going on in your organization right now. For those of you who aren't familiar with the second victim, which is one that, that some folks asked me about yesterday, second victim, which I believe is a very unfortunate name, but a very important concept, which says that in the context of, of any kind of healthcare tragedy, a bad outcome, a mistake, the first victim, if you will, is the patient and the family. They're the ones most immediately impacted by that. But at the same time, all those who provided that care, if they were engaged in that care, and if their care, that care really mattered to them, we're also very negatively impacted by that outcome. How are we making sure they're not forgotten about in the process of taking care of the patient? Because often what we're doing when a bad outcome happens, the first response is, how do we cover ourselves? And often the first response of all those involved is shame and embarrassment, and they want to isolate themselves. And so we've created a program at Curling Clinic where we make sure we proactively reach out to them 
And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. The consequences, as we know, burnout clinicians and staff provide burnout clinician and staff care. You can't provide five out of five care if you're one or two out of five clinician. And yet we're asking our patients every day through surveys, through patient satisfaction surveys, were you happy with your care? Would you recommend this to somebody else? And we're disappointed when they don't all say yes. And yet, why should we be when the people who are providing that care often don't have anything in the tank to provide that five out of five care that we're asking about? It's a quality and safety issue. It's a systematic review that I didn't include in this just came out in JAMA three weeks ago looking at this very thing and saying that we're only catching up. This is a young science and we're only beginning to catch up on the data around this, but we know that there's some quality and safety issues going on. And now it's an accreditation issue as well with the ACGME. Here's the vision. Thriving clinicians and staff provide thriving clinician and staff care. This is what our patients want from us and what we want from ourselves and from each other. So how do we get there? So how are you? More important question is, how would somebody who knows you well, who works with you, who has to experience you, how would they say you were? If you don't know the answer to that, I would challenge you to ask them, what's it like to work with me? Am I life giving to you or am I life sucking when you're around me? Yeah, and then be open to the answer. Frame it, it's a complex problem. Family doctor, I'm a generalist. I like to think about things in models that make it pretty simple for me. And I've started thinking about this really in two ways. There are two dynamic tensions that are going on around this whole issue of physician distress. One is what I call the operational side of it. It's the side that we like to focus on, and I believe we should, particularly in the context of burnout. The operational side says there's a lot of forces going on in healthcare right now that are sucking the life from us, that are taking the joy of medicine away from us. Those are things like the regulatory burdens that we have regularly. Those are things like the administrative hassles, the technological inefficiencies, the structural problems that we have in terms of how we think about health care. All those things become things that are taking away the reason we went into health care in the first place. And I'm not going to pretend that those don't exist. Those are real, and we need to continue as a health care profession to push back at some of those things that are not only taking the life away from us, but I believe are also taking away from quality patient care that we want to provide. So that's the one side. The other side is what I call relational. It's looking at how we connect, how we, how we br come together in the context of providing this care. It's not just about us as individuals, it's also about us as a culture. And what do we do with that? Now here's the thing about this in the context of the continuum from burnout to, to thriving, and I didn't put this slide in here. But when I think about burnout, and I truly think about how we help to move not only individuals but the group up that continuum toward thriving, this operational piece becomes very important. Because we, if people are drowning, we want to pull them out of the water. We don't want to ask how they're doing. We want to get them to shore. We want to get them breathing again. Then we want to begin to say, how can we get you to a better place? We'll never get to thriving by only, fo only focusing on the operational pieces. At some point, we're going to have to start saying, how do we connect as a community? And in the middle of that, which I believe is the most important anchor to all this, is what I call meaning and identity. How do we get back to connecting with why we went into this in the first place? Thinking about your medical school essay that you wrote as to why you want to go into me to medical school in the first place. Actually believing that that's still possible. And then identity. Who are we as a profession? Because I believe we've lost a lot of that along the way. How do we get back to that again and help each other in that way? And surrounding this, we know from the data, are two very important things. One is leadership. There's great data that says leadership matters when it comes to physician culture and when it comes to distress and burnout. And it makes a huge difference in terms of helping or hindering our ability to do that. And then culture. Culture we're going to talk about in a moment as well. But how are we creating a culture that is uplifting and supportive rather than one that often postures and often shames those who are reaching out for help. We've thought about this in our own organization as a, what we call the four pillars, and this is based on some work by Dyke Drummond. We found this helpful to frame it so we can start thinking about how we can do something about that and taking a, 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 a challenge that seems to be too big 
and starting to break it down into component parts. And those parts are, first of all, well-being and burnout education and skills development. Come back to that in a moment. Crisis management and prevention. Fourth aim, continuous improvement. How do we take these, the, the same ideas we apply to quality improvement and apply them to this work? And then finally, culture and connection. So let's break it down. Here's my first premise. If you have the initials MD or DO after your name, you're a leader. I don't care if you have any other title at all. You're a leader. Why? Because those who work with you are looking to you to provide leadership, whether it's on your healthcare team or whether it's in some kind of formal leadership role. So the question is not whether you're a leader. The only question is whether you're an effective leader or not. It goes for the residents here as well, because those who you work with on the wards, even your juniors, even your students, are looking to you to lead. So how do we begin to do that? Here's the other premise. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. If we have 54% high-risk burnout right now, we have a system that's designed to get us there. And when the data comes out later this year for the study that they've repeated again with Shanafelt and his group, we're going to look at that and say, that's what our system is getting us right now. And if we're not happy with that, we need to do something different. Here's the other premise. To change the culture of your practice, to change the culture of your organization, we must do something differently. If we keep doing the same thing, we're likely going to get the same results or perhaps worse. So here's how we're starting to approach these four pillars at Carilion Clinic. First thing is about well-being and burnout education and skills development. As I shared with you, we now have what we call the Faculty Vitality and Professional Well-Being Committee. That committee started out four years ago with a group of what I consider now visionary and renegade physicians. I was in that group. I was in that group because I was so disgusted with our organization's inability to do anything around this, to even acknowledge that this was a problem, even as we walked around day by day and just saw shells of human beings providing patient care. A year ago, after the survey came out and after a lot of persistence on our part, that, that, that committee was actually formally recognized by our organization. Not only formally recognized, but we have executive sponsorship of our chief medical officer and our dean of our medical school. We now have the attention of the organization. That committee is essential to the work that we do. We've structured it in an ambassador model. We've asked the clinical chairs of each department to say, who will be your thought leader? Who will be your opinion leader representing your group on this committee? They will serve as ambassadors because we believe that, that there are microcultures within healthcare. And what's going to help our surgical colleagues Address physician distress is very different than what's going to help our internal medicine colleagues or our pediatric colleagues. So how do we begin to look at this and, and do this in a way that we begin to spread it out throughout the whole organization? I talked earlier about quadruple aim language, that we use fourth aim language now. That when our chief medical officer talks, wherever she talks, she always says, we are a quadruple aim organization. Sadly, that has not spilled over into our whole C-suite. We have a lot of our administrative executives who still use the term triple aim. And every time they do, I cringe because I think you don't know what the, how that sounds to physicians who are now tuned in to quadruple aim language. It sounds like you don't care. And I don't think any administrator wants to send that message. I don't believe ours really believe that. I think they're blind, remember? Hard to hear. Connecting this to quality, safety, and risk. I have leaned on our VP for quality regularly around making sure that we include this in the conversation, that we understand this is a quality issue. And for many, when I started this conversation, it wasn't until we started connecting this with quality that we really got the attention of some in our own organization. It's a huge quality issue. Department and specific activities and committees, we're encouraging each department to have their own committees and groups. System and department surveys, we're about to survey again in 2019 after the national survey comes out. Our chief medical officer just announced that yesterday. I'm going to be challenging all of our clinical chairs to say, you got six months to see what you can do to begin to turn this data around. Websites and, and resources that we have within our organization, and we're starting to figure out ways to publicize those so people are much more aware of all the resources that we do have and connect them together. Crisis management and prevention. This gets into what's happening right now with the LifeBridge program here. We have EAP and we have counseling available to our physicians. We did a, a survey a year and a half ago 
of our physicians around their attitudes and their, their, their opinions about our employee assistance program. Almost 50% of them said, I will never, I would never go to EAP if I had a problem. Another 25% said, it is highly likely that I would never go to EAP if I had a problem. Now, I believe that's a two-pronged a two problem. First of all, it means that EAP needs to do a better job of, of, of promoting itself and helping people understand why it's there and what it does. But I also believe that, that that also says that we need to find other resources for physicians and we can't organizationally just say, well, we've got EAP, just go there. Because there's a lot of compelling reasons why physicians don't want to go to EAP. And again, that's why I love what's happening here and part of the reason why I wanted to come here and help support this. Because having confidential resources that are outside of an organization is sometimes a safe place for physicians to do things that for many of us would be a very courageous act, which would be to ask for help. Healthcare resources, making sure that our physicians not only have psychological support, but they have their own physician, their own personal physician to help support their physical health as well. What I find is many physicians don't have a physician until they have a crisis in their own lives and all of a sudden they're scrambling for one. So for those of you who are here right now who don't have a personal physician, I would encourage you to get one. Trust team, we talked earlier, we have a trust team around the second victim work and we have peer supporters who um, I'm one of them, who, who, who are standing by to help support our other clinicians should things come up in terms of bad outcomes, or now we've expanded that to both Board of Medicine inquiries and legal inquiries. And the job of these peer supporters is in no way to talk about the case. We have risk management and we have a, a peer review process that does that. It's to be, come by these folks' side and say, I've been through this. And if the experience is anything for you like it was for me, you're going to need some help and support and being there for them. Crisis hotline, making sure that folks know if they really are at that point where they feel like they're at their wits end, they have somewhere to reach out to. And then a website, making sure that people have quick access on our website to those things that they might want. And again, that's happening in the medical society, starting to do those very things to help support not only this community, but the larger medical community. And talking about it, talking about it is so important to disarm the stigma that we have around this. Fourth aim, continuous improvement. A very simple process that when we implemented this truly in our department, revolutionized it in one year, dropped our, our high risk burnout rate by 10% among our physicians in family and community medicine. Really simple. What are the three things that are your pain points? Survey your group, find out. They shouldn't be surprising. But then get a group together and make a plan to do something about them. For us, our top three were our electronic health record. But rather than just saying, oh, it's the electronic health record, we started to get more specific and said, wait a minute, what is it about the electronic health record? Because we have some clinicians in our group who love this tool. So what, what's, what's, the, what's the, the gap here? What's the blind spot? And what we found is, not surprising, it broke down to a few things. One is that some of them were still using it like they did on 10 years ago when they first learned how to use it. For some, it was data entry. We know what a hassle that was. And so we leaned on the organization and said, this is not okay. We can't have people typing at 11 o'clock at night who don't know how to type notes. So we, we, we invested in voice recognition software for all of our clinicians. We have some clinicians that are using scribes. But we have ways to say, we want you to work to license, and we want to make sure that this is sustainable over many years. And finally, community and culture. As some of you have heard me say already, in any organization, there's only two types of culture, culture by design or culture by default, culture by choice or culture by chance. And if you don't know which one yours is, it's a culture by default. And so the challenge is to say, what would it look like if you were very deliberate about saying, who and how do we want to be together? As we do this good and important work, how's that going to work for us? And talking about it. And what's amazing is when you start talking about it, very thoughtful people come up with ideas that are wonderful and very life-changing. And it's not, this is not big. Okay, we talked about this a little bit last night at the, at, the, uh, at the dinner. Something as simple as creating a culture where we acknowledge each other on a regular basis. Because I know many of you have walked down the halls and tried to engage someone as they're walking by and just say hello and saw a dead man or woman walking, shell of a human being walking by you without even acknowledging your presence. A colleague. That's culture by default. We shouldn't accept that. That's not okay. We need each other. We need to be supporting each other. So if you believe that, how do you begin to create that? Culture is the way group thinks, acts, and interacts. 
simple as that. If you want to find out what yours is, ask the newest hire in your own department, and they'll tell you exactly what the culture is like and what it's been like for them to try to fit in to the culture. Here's your secret weapons. Well, I'll break down this data really easily for you. What things make doctors the most satisfied? It's about relationships. Relationships with our patients, certainly. With colleagues, we often forget about. Loved ones, essential. Tragic often in terms of relational breakup that happens in the course of our professional journey. And then relationship with self. I want to leave you with this. That I believe, and this came to me as, I would, as I've been thinking about this over many years, I was certainly trained and socialized to believe that the patient, my patients, were the relationship that was most essential. That relationship is vital, and certainly that is the focus of our work. But what I also realized is that even my patient, who I get to know the best, either I get to know them well because they're in the process of a, of a healthcare crisis or in the process of dying, which means I won't know them very long, or it's over many years. But during that time, I may see them five, six times a year at most, whereas I see most of my colleagues almost every day. And yet some of my patients know me, and sometimes I know them better than I know the people who I'm working with every day. So how do we do something about that and say, wait a minute, we're the team providing care to the patients. This is not me as an individual. It's us as a group. And so I want us to start thinking about something that I call Peer Rx. It's that idea of how do we connect as peers around each other. And we're about to roll out a program that we call PRX90, only because I just love the way that sounds. Um, but PRX90 also has some method behind it. It says basically that how, if we want to create a culture by design in our busyness, how do we make sure we're connecting with each other deliberately on a regular basis? And so what we're proposing is that you connect with a buddy a professional buddy or buddies, and you have two check-ins once a week. I call it 90 seconds. It's metaphorical, but the emphasis is it's not going to take very long. By text or phone, and then for 90 minutes once a month, and again, it doesn't have to be 90 minutes, but you make sure you connect in person, and you're asking these questions for 90 seconds. How are you doing? How can I help support you? Really simple. I've been doing this for a few years now with two of my buddies, and it's amazing the power that it has in the middle of a busy day when I'm thinking, oh, man, this, is, this day is going to be a grind. And all of a sudden, I get an email or a text that says, buddy check. And all of a sudden, I know somebody else is out there cheering me on, knowing what it is that I'm going through. I got one yesterday right in the middle of one of my talks just because they knew I was going to be here, and they wanted to make sure things were going okay. How can I help support you? And the answer can never be, I'm fine. That's one of our rules. Has to be more specific. How are you doing? And then for 90 minutes, how are you doing? What's going well? What are you struggling with? How can I help support you? Because the other thing that we want to emphasize, we have not been trained in healthcare. We've not been socialized to ask for help. We're the helpers, not the helpees. So how can we train each other to, on a regular basis, say, it's OK to ask for help. Not only is it OK, it's sanity and wisdom. So how can we make sure we're doing that? Why would it be surprised that sometimes we need somebody to say, you know what, that's really hard. But you know what, let's talk about it. I'm here with you. Let's process this a little bit. So what would it take to be able to say, I love my work? What would it take to be able to say, I love my life? My hope for you, for each one of you, is that on a regular basis, you can ask yourself that question and be able to say, you know what, I do love my life. I do love my work. But it's not going to happen by accident. And I can tell you that the forces within our profession and within healthcare will be constantly pulling you down that continuum towards survival. And so it's only by deliberate action on your part on a regular basis that you're going to be able to not only get to that place of well or thriving, but stay there as well. So remember, the goal is not survival. The goal is thriving, or whatever term you would use for that. The goal is finding meaning regularly in our work, finding fulfillment in the work that we do, and making sure that we're connecting on a regular basis. That's all I have. I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we don't, we, Mukta says that we do. And I'm, I'm going to be staying here afterwards, and I'm happy to help talk with you as well. What questions do we have? Yes, please. Um, in the past 24 hours, I've heard you talk three times. I'm so sorry. And I say that, I say that with great appreciation. I really do. Thank you. students are in school and our residents are learning so much about the 
human body that they failed to learn anything about human beings. Mm. Mm. And I think it's important. I'm glad you mentioned the soul because we we think we're making progress when we talk to students and residents about, well, you know, your patients, human beings have a soul. Yeah. I think that's progress, but I would make it even even further and say, no, it's not that human beings have a soul. It's that we are first and foremost spiritual human. We're spirits yeah. who happen to find ourselves in the human condition. So if we start with that premise, it's a little different way to look at it. Yeah. Also, I'm glad that you mentioned leadership. All of us, I think, can relate to the fact that I believe that the role of the leader is to ensure success of those they lead. Yeah. And not to create undue barriers. But we run we run into people in very senior, powerful positions who appear to think that their job is to create barriers mm. and make our jobs worse and make our lives more distressful. Yeah. And it seems that sometimes the only solution to that is to get another leader. Mm. <laughs> and we can't do that. Yeah. So it just compounds the distress that we have to live with in our environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all those. The, what, what comes to me out of that, first of all, thank you. I, I, I certainly agree with all of that. The, I believe that, that required reading for everyone in a leadership position should be the work of Robert Greenleaf. Robert Greenleaf coined the phrase servant leadership. So when you hear people talk about aspiring to be a servant leader, that sounds really nice. Most people, most people use the word, but they don't understand the concept. And the concept is exactly what you talked about. He said that truly a servant leader's job is to make sure those who are impacted by their leadership are regularly uplifted. That, they, that, that the job of the leader is to bring out the best in them during the time of their leadership. Not to make it harder. And actually, I want to credit, I'm, I'm forgetting her name, one of the women last night who commented after my talk said that very thing. She's a physician and she said, in my leadership role, I expect you to hold me accountable for making sure that I'm, le I'm serving you as a leader. It's a tough thing. You're straddling two worlds. And we watch it, our clinical chairs, I watch it all the time. And I'm a regular guardrail for my own chair when he starts to get what I call too administrative. Okay? You're starting to think more about the organization than about those who are being impacted by your leadership. I get it that you straddle those two worlds, and I get it that, that no margin, no mission, but at the same time, no doctors, no anything. And so how do we make sure that we're doing both of those? I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Yeah, please. It seems like one of the most limited resources we have is time. Mm. <laughs> they have time. We all have the same amount, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. And, and certainly, the work that we do is going to be time intensive. So what I'll share with I, I, no, I, I don't have any creative ways to create more time. Part of the way I believe one creates more time is by priority, priority management, by being able to learn how to say no. And that's been something that has taken me decades of my own career because part of how I was socialized as well is to say, oh yeah, I'll do that, and feel guilty every time I said no. And we're trying to figure out in our own organization because often those people who say yes and do well, guess what happens? They get asked to do more rather than looking at those people who I believe often are making the conscious decision to say, no, I don't think I want to do that. Being a full-time physician is enough. I don't think I want to serve on five committees. And so how do, we, how do we find that balance? But I do believe part of it is priority management and saying what's important in your life and being able then sometimes to say no, knowing that there, you know, as, a, as, as a father, part of what I always told my children is life is about choice and consequence. Now, there's good consequences and bad consequences, but, but we all make choices and we have to accept that there are consequences to that. So uh, I was, we had a, a, a well-being committee meeting on Tuesday night and one of our orthopedic surgeons was there. And, um, and he was saying they, they, ch they have chosen in their department to have scribes as part of their work in order to make their, their life better, so buying back time. And he said, there is a financial cost to this. Now, I was not weeping because I know how much our orthopedic surgeons make. But he said, and it's all relative, okay, and I, again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding of that. 
um, that he said, we made a conscious decision that there would be a financial hit for this, and we took it anyway. And he said, it was the best thing that I've ever done in terms of my own work. Well, he had to, first of all, be able to say, I'm willing to have a consequence to that, but a consequence that has been more than paid back by the fact that he's able to spend more time with his family. So it's, it's those kinds of things. And I think it's also really challenging how we structure our work and, and, and do things like that. Um, we've, we have tried to restructure our call system within our own organization to really say, how do we make this in a way that a few people aren't really sh uh, uh, carrying the burden of a lot of call, which we know, that, again, those of you who take call on a regular basis, even if you're on call from home, which sounds like really glamorous, right? Um, it is a burden to many people because they know at any point in time they could get called, and, and just that alone takes a lot of emotional energy. So I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but I hope it helped. So that's a great question uh, because one of the things that certainly as healthcare leaders that I've learned as a healthcare leader is that I need to make sure in the different cultures that I'm traveling in that I'm speaking the language of that group. So as I said earlier, we started to talk about physician distress. When I took the idea of physician distress over to our C-suite and our administrative leaders, wow, okay, they, they, really, they, weren't, they weren't particularly compassionate about that. Get back to work, we pay you a lot of money. Um, when I went to them and talked about, rather than physician distress, talked about quality and safety, all of a sudden we had a very different conversation going on. So what I find helpful around that, because I find this with a lot of our administrative leaders, is they like stories. They like to tell stories and they like to hear stories about how healthcare is impacting individuals. And so being able to take to them stories that contain that soul, or when you hear them share stories that contain soul, pointing that out and being able to just start that language. Because again, none of us are, are, are unfamiliar with the language of soul. They get that at their own personal level. They just haven't figured out how to bring that into often the healthcare. And that's not everybody. We have, we have many healthcare leaders who get that very much. Thank you. Um, uh, as Dr. Panda said, about a, a year and a half ago, we put together a physician uh, task force that's been looking at um, the whole issue of physician distress and burnout and trying to identify things that we can do within our community. And the program we've created is called LifeBridge because we want to provide access to resources and um, support that can pr pr help create a bridge between the different elements of your life and provide encouragement and support in the physician community. Um, we have uh, connected to the Medical Society website, but its own website I hope you'll check out. It's called LifeBridgeChattanooga.org, LifeBridgeChattanooga.org. And we have a lot of resources and articles and research and uh, tips and pointers and links to apps that are things that can remind you. I need to re be reminded um, several times a day to stand up and stretch because I'll get hunched over at my computer and I need to walk around the office uh, a few times. I mean, just sometimes silly things like that can make a difference. We've also created, and on the table when you came in, there were some um, brochures and we also have, um, oops, moved your mouse. Oh. Um, we also have some little pocket cards. We hope you'll take them around if you see somebody who looks like they need some support and encouragement. And we also have created a little something to put in the back of your lanyards that have got the LifeBridge logo and the phone number and website. Um, we, we also um, have 
identified um, several uh, counselors in the community who um, are listed on our website and um, we've raised funds to be able to provide access to counseling sessions up to six that will cover the cost. Um, you can contact a counselor directly through email or call them directly in the phone numbers listed on our website. Um, they, they'll return your call and set up an appointment, um, typically within 72 hours. Um, as an alternative, there's also a phone number, um, which comes to me, and just initially to see how much demand there is and what kind of questions we're getting. Um, and I, I promise you complete confidentiality um, if you need support and encouragement. So we have a lot of different resources. Um, we also did a survey, and there's some blue folders outside if you want to grab one. We did a survey um, of uh, 1,250 uh, uh, physicians in Hamilton County. We had uh, 375 responses, so I think it was a statistically valid survey. And... Um, it won't be any surprise to any of you who got up at 7 o'clock to come this morning that our data reflects the national data, and a couple of elements were actually a tiny bit worse. So we're using that as a basis to determine our next steps. We do have a, a well-being task force, and I know time is your most precious commodity, but if any of you are interested in offering your input or your insights and joining us in any of this work, um, we don't meet terribly frequently, but I think what we're doing is very important. So feel free to shoot me an email. My email is ray, R-A-E, at chatmd.org, and that's C-H-A-T-T-M-D dot org. Um, and let me know what your interest is, if you have ideas or suggestions. Um, we have met with the medical executive committees at all of the hospitals. Um, we will be following up and taking the full research report to um, executive leadership at all the systems. And um, yesterday we met with the leaders of a number of the larger groups in town. So we're trying to work on multiple levels. And the bottom line is that... Um, you all spend your time caring for the community and caring for patients. We do a lot of work in the community, too, to improve community health. But right now, we want to improve the health of the community of physicians, and that's what we're about at your medical society. So um, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate those of you who were there last night as well, and we look forward to working for you and finding some, some maybe some new ways we can chart the path ahead. So thank you.